let me welcome you to this fourth lecture on uh, reinforcement learning. We spent uh, the first three lectures to give a broad overview of what the course is about, the field of reinforcement learning, the methods that we're going to emphasize. Uh, we talked about Alpha Zero and other related uh, uh, games and how the material of this course relates to those. Um, starting today, we're going to take a closer look at various approximation methods. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about the two types, major types of approximation, which are approximation in value space, approximation in policy space. Then we're going to talk about how we pass from one approximation to the other. Uh, from values to policies and then to new values and to new policies and close the loop in a policy iteration type of method. Then we are going to discuss some general issues of approximation value space. Um, then we'll discuss some special issues that have to do with multi-step look ahead in the context of our approximation value space. And the last topic for today is going to be rollout methods focused on deterministic finite state problems. So in the way of review, let's remember the stochastic dynamic programming algorithm, which involves a system uh, that has a state XK, control UK, a random disturbance WK, which uh, has a probability distribution that depends on xk and uk. And uh, we have a system equation and a cost per stage. And uh, the dynamic programming algorithm produces this j stars, the optimal cost to go functions of the tail sub problems that start at a state xk and go optimally all the way to the end of the horizon. And here we're talking about a finite horizon problem with n stages. So the dynamic programming algorithm starts with this terminal cost condition and goes backwards, generating j star n minus one, j star n minus two. And at the last step, it obtains j stars of zero as a function of the initial condition. And this is the optimal cost uh, of the problem the optimal cost function of the problem. Now, once we have this J stars by cranking backwards this algorithm, then we can generate online optimal controls by using this minimization. Generate first U zero star given J one star, then go to the next state X one generate U1 star and so on. We go forward like this. Uh, this may be viewed as offline training. This may be viewed as online play, online generation of controls. But the main difficulties of this scheme is that there's too much computation to calculate these J stars and also too much storage, too much memory storage to store them in lookup tables because the state space may be very large. So the remedy is approximation in value space where we don't compute these J stars, but we compute some J tilde functions, approximations, and we use them in this control selection scheme in place of J star. There are some other difficulties here, like uh, the expected value may be here, may be expensive, and we may want to approximate it. The, minimization may be difficult and we may want to simplify it. Overall, this is the illustrative uh, figure for the one step look ahead. Now you have seen this figure before without all this other stuff here. And uh, uh, what it does, given J tilde K plus one at state XK, whatever state we might be, it does this minimization uh, over UK, minimizes the sum of the first step uh, cost plus the 
cost of the future as evaluated by this J tilde function. And uh, in this way, we can do online play. As we generate new states, we can select controls. The scheme also defines a policy. It gives us a control for every state xk. This policy will generally denote policies like that, a mu tilde, mu tilde k, mu zero, mu zero tilde, mu one tilde, and so on. Um, and uh, these policies can also be approximated by offline training, and then you can use them for the future. Now, there are three approximations here. And the nice thing is that they can be addressed more or less separately. The first approximation is how to construct the J tilde functions. And there are several methods that we can use. Um, one possibility is problem approximation. Uh, instead of J star, use the J star of another problem, a simpler problem for which we can approximate we can compute exactly its optimal cost function and we can use it as an approximation j tilde for the more difficult problem that we have at hand so that's problem approximations one way you do it the other possibilities roll out for which i talked about several times in the past three lectures model predictive control is closely connected with rollout i talked about in the last lecture at the end Another possibility is to use some kind of uh, training from data to calculate this J tilde functions here. For example, use neural networks, train a neural network from data. And uh, uh, a number of ways of generating this data, we'll talk about that uh, later. We'll also talk about that, about the training process for neural networks. Aggregation is still another method we may have some time to look at it uh, near the end of the course. Aggregation deals with simplifying the problem by reducing its dimension with some approximation, of course. Then the lower dimensional problem is solved exactly and its optimal cost function is used an approximation for the larger dimensional problem. So that's the first approximation, constructing cost function J tilde to use in this scheme. The second type of approximation is how to simplify this expected value operation, which can be expensive. And we have uh, several possibilities here. One is to simplify the probability distribution of WK, and in particular, make it deterministic. So choose a typical value for WK, let's say it's expected value or a typical value and stick it in here in place of the random variable. And now the expectation disappears, becomes uh, WK is only a single value. This is called certainty equivalence. And it is correct to use certainty equivalence in linear quadratic problems. Uh, as we saw in the, the previous uh, lectures. On the other hand, in just about every other case, it is not correct to choose certainty equivalent, to use certain equivalence. However, we still may use it as an approximation to simplify this expected value. Another possibility is adaptive simulation. Okay, so now to do this minimization, we have to compute this expected value for every control. Some of these controls may be promising, may look good on the basis of some consideration, some heuristic, and others may look bad. For example, after a few, with some simulation, we can determine that some of these controls cannot be optimal and therefore they can be discarded or more appropriately, just simulate it less. Don't, don't worry about that, about those controls so much. So we do good, uh, we do extensive simulation uh, for the more promising controls and, and more, uh, uh, and, and less, uh, and spend less effort to simulate 
the Q factors of controls that look like promising. And that's adaptive simulation. And Monte Carlo tree search is a form of adaptive simulation that we're going to talk about, I think, next week. OK, now the third approximation is to make this minimization simpler. And uh, this can be very difficult and may take too much time. Um, so there are a few things that one can do. A great the, the greatest difficulty in this minimization is if either u takes continuous values or it takes a finite number of values, but very large number. So you need to do a lot of calculations here. So if u takes continuous values in a continuous space, we may discretize that space and uh, look at the grid points of the discretization. Another possibility is to, and this applies also to the case where u takes a, a finite number, but a large number of values. We can simplify the constraint set by throwing away some of the controls that look less promising. Another possibility still arises in multi-agent problems, and I talked about that last time, where U is, has M components, consists of M components corresponding to M agents. And then instead of doing minimization over the joint choices of all the agents, we can we can have them choose one at a time. And this simplifies the minimization a great deal. So that's approximation in value space with one step look ahead. And uh, the three basic issues that we have to face. And a lot of our work is going to revolve on how you handle these issues. Now, it's also possible to use multi-step look ahead, approximation in value space, where we take into account explicitly the cost of several stages. So here, instead of solving a one-step problem, we solve an L-stage problem. This is a finite horizon dynamic programming problem, but with a smaller horizon than the original. And we, at state xk, we minimize the cost corresponding to the first L stages plus a, an, another term that accounts approximately for the cost of the optimal cost of the remaining stages. Now, once we solve this uh, L step problem, we're going to obtain a control for the first stage and policies for the remaining stages. Remember, this is a this is a, a stochastic dynamic programming problem, and uh, the minimization is going to yield policies. However, the first control is just a single control; it's not a function. Now, once we solve this problem, we keep U K to apply at this state. And we discard all the rest. We throw away all this other stuff. We just keep the first control UK. So that's the way this multi-step look ahead scheme uh, works. And um, one point that I want to make here is that conceptually, this is not different than one step look ahead. Basically, we minimize the cost of the current stage plus some J tilde. And this J tilde involves minimization over L minus one steps plus an approximate cost to go. So the effective one step look ahead approximate cost function here is the optimal cost function of the L minus one stages dynamic programming problem with terminal cost this J tilde over here. So we could ignore multi-step look ahead because it's really the same as one step look ahead. 
but there are some issues associated with uh, with using multiple stages and uh, uh, the benefits that one may uh, obtain by using such a structure. Are there any questions here? Okay, so all of this was for finite horizon. Uh, let's uh, consider one step look ahead in the approximation value space. So one step and multi-step in infinite horizon problems. Now we have a similar structure, but the cost per stage does not change over time. Uh, the system equation does not change over time. And there's also a discount factor, which could be one and could be less than one that comes into Bellman's equation. Bellman's equation, the right-hand side is this expression here with J star in place of J tilde. So in approximation, in value space, there's a mistake here. That should be value space. I'm sorry, some typo, you can see it. I'll correct it in the corrected version of the slides. Um, the, the structure is, uh, is an approximation to the right-hand side of Bellman's equation with J tilde in place of J star. And uh, there are again, the three approximations. And uh, uh, what we do here is minimize over U the Q factor corresponding to J tilde, which I denote by Q tilde. It's this expression here. So we're going to be talking about approximation value space in this uh, language also, minimize over Q factors. Uh, and these are the Q factors. Okay. Now there's a multi-step look ahead version that involves a discounted version of an L-step problem with the future approximated by this expression here. And uh, at xk, we solve this L-step problem. We keep the first component of the optimal solution and throw away the rest. And one thing that I want to point your attention to is that alpha to the L multiplies J tilde and alpha, when it's less than one, as L increases, becomes very small. So the effect of this future approximation becomes less important. In fact, it can be neglected if as L increases and becomes sufficiently large. Okay, so now let's talk about the other type of method, approximation in policy space. This is the major alternative to approximation in value space. And the idea here is to select the policy from within a restricted class of policies by optimization. So what we do here is we're looking for a controller that depends on the state and also depends on some parameter. This defines the a parametric family of policies that depend on a parameter RK. And we, by using data, we choose RK optimally uh, with a view towards performance or with a view towards approximating some good, good policy that we know. And the training can be done with uh, various approximation architecture type of methods, including neural networks. Exactly how this can be done, uh, I'm going to discuss a little bit today, but much more thoroughly in the future. Excuse me. Now, approximation policy space has one important advantage once you have computed these parameters, it is very easy to calculate controls. We don't have to do any minimization. 
we just look up this function, the lookup table of this function, or we generate for a given state, this, the value of this function, and that gives us the control. So the online computation of controls is often much faster. A state XK, we just crank this neural network or whatever this parametric architecture is to give us a control. But there is also an important disadvantage. Once we choose the controller, once we fix these parameters, then we are stuck with these parameters. We cannot change them without a lot of training. So we cannot do online replanning. If the system changes on us as it's operating, then this controller, it's very hard to change it, to do online replanning. That's an important disadvantage of approximation in policy space. Okay, now, so how do we combine the two? How do we go from values to policies and then to new values again and to new policies? Uh, we've discussed this a little bit in the previous lectures, but let's, we're going to do a review here. How do we go from values, from J tildes to mu tildes? Uh, well, the approximate cost to go function is J tilde, define a suboptimal policy through one step or multi step look ahead minimization. And uh, that's uh, and that's uh, that's a policy that we may consider rep representing in some way. Uh, so, how do how can we represent these mu tildes and simplify the computation of their values? The idea is to approximate mu tilde using some kind of least squares fit and training data. So we have J tilde, we can select various states, representative states, calculate the one step look ahead controls. So for state XKS, the control is UKS. And uh, this represents a single sample pair, a single sample of our training set. We do this for many samples of sample states. So we built this training set and uh, we can do this for one step look ahead or for multi-step look ahead. And now we can use this training set to train a mu tilde function. And how do we do that? Um, basically, it's a least squares fit type of uh, approximation. As an example, suppose you have a finite number of controls and um, we introduce a parametric family of randomized policies as an approximation in policy space. RK is the parameter. And then we try to find a parametric policy that matches the data, matches these pairs, XKS, UKS. We have this training set, we have Q errors, one error term for each data point, data pair, and we solve this least squares problem. And that gives us a parameter, I'll tilde k, and this defines a, a random a, a policy. Now, for this least squares fit to make sense in practice, uh, the the values that the parametric approximation should take must be continuous. Uh, on the other hand, if we have a finite number of controls, there's only a finite number of values that these can take and uh, our control can take. And we are going to estimate them by continuous values. How do we deal with that? Well, the, the control samples take discrete values, zero or one for various uh, values of the state. However, we represent the parametric control values with a randomized policy. So this become probabilities and they sum up to one. And uh, if you're familiar with classification, uh, the policy becomes like a classifier. 
classifies every state, every every state to be of category corresponding to the to a control. And um, and we're going to discuss this in the next slide. So let's go to the next slide. So that's how we go from J tildes to mu tildes, generate a training set and do least squares fit. Now, how do we go from policies from mu tildes to J tildes? Well, we do this by rollout. We start with some policy, the, which may be represented uh, may have been obtained by approximation policy space. This is a base policy that we can use in a rollout scheme, one step or multi-step, whereby after the look ahead tree, we use the policy to generate cost to go approximations. J tilde here is an approximation to the cost of the base policy. That's what rollout is. And it may also involve a cost function approximation at the end. So given a policy, we obtain values. And from these values, we obtain a new policy, which is a rollout policy. And there are some important issues here. How do we calculate the cost of a policy? Well, one way to do it is by simulation. If the problem is deterministic, this is not a big difficulty because, uh, okay, from a given state, xk plus one, we just run the policy up to the end of the horizon and we accumulate the stage costs. So it's a single trajectory cost accumulation. On the other hand, if the problem is stochastic, then we have to do Monte Carlo simulation and that requires running the policy many times from xk plus one to get a lot of samples and take a Monte Carlo average, which will be an approximation to the cost of the policy starting from that state. Okay, so from values, we can go to policies and from policies, we can go to values and then to new policies. So altogether, we have this scheme which uh, we discussed a little bit uh, in uh, the previous lectures. We start from a base policy. From that policy, we obtain cost values and by simulation. And we feed them into an approximation in value space scheme, a rollout, and we obtain policy data. And then we fit a policy to this policy data through approximation policy space. And that gives us a representation for an approximate rollout policy. And then we go back again and we have a loop of perpetual rollout. Now that's a very important uh, concept because it relates to a fundamental algorithm in, um, in dynamic programming called policy iteration. And uh, the main property of this algorithm is that in its idealized form, with no approximations involved at all, each new policy, this rollout policy has no worse cost function than the preceding one, is an improvement. This is called the cost improvement property. In other words, the new policy pi tilde has a better cost than the previous policy for all initial states, all x, k, and k. So that's the cost improvement property and it holds assuming no approximations. So in principle, the algorithm is capable of self-improvement and self-learning, generate its own data and generate improved policies by itself without being fed any information. It just generates its cost data, its policy data, and obtains a new policy uh, and uh, the new policy is an improvement. Now this is an idealized property. And let me also 
mention that, uh, okay, I mentioned the, uh, the policy duration algorithm, and indeed its foundation is the policy improvement property. Alpha zero uses policy duration and a lot of other uh, practical algorithms, uh, particularly, well, in games and in other domains are based on policy duration and approximate versions of this property here. Now, if this loop is done with approximations, then the self-improvement property is approximate. In other words, there's an epsilon error here that, that, that is involved. Uh, in practice, uh, what you see is that you have cost improvement for several iterations up until you get close to optimality. And then the method tends to oscillate within a zone of this optimal performance. And how big that zone is depends on how much approximation you have been doing in these loops here. So we will come back to this quite a bit in the future, but uh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is a concatenation of value approximations and policy approximations. Values generate policies, policies generate values, and we keep going. And there are also several variations of this scheme, uh, which we're going to look at uh, in, the, in the latter half of uh, the course, involving so-called optimistic policy iteration, where there are, okay, there are gross approximations here, Q learning that involves Q functions rather than cost functions, methods of temporal differences that you may have heard uh, if you have been reading, you may have seen if you have been reading the reinforcement learning uh, literature. All of these involve challenging implementation issues. They have interesting properties and uh, uh, they have a lot of pitfalls in how they are applied. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And it's very important to understand exactly what they're doing and where they can go wrong. Are there any questions? Um, Professor, I have a question. So can you give me an example about uh, how policy can generate new values? how a policy can generate a new value. Yeah. If I run the policy from a given initial state, I'm going to pay a value, right? I can accumulate a cost along the okay. trajectory and that would be a sample value, right? Okay. Uh, how can I generate it? Now, you may be able to generate it analytically, but usually it's by simulation, by running the computer. You have the model on the computer, and from a given state, you go forward and run that policy, run the system with that policy. That generates a sequence of cost values, which you add up, and that gives you a sample cost value from the given policy. Now, yeah, we're going to do examples. Point. We're going to do some specific examples. OK, but, OK. Yeah, go ahead, please. You were saying something. Uh, yeah, I mean, even if you generate these samples of new cost, but you still kind of don't know which, which, which cost do you want. You average the values. That's what Monte Carlo simulation will do. Okay, okay. And that will give you, in the limit, the expected value that you're looking for. These are random costs that you generate but you average them by Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now let's discuss a few generic issues of approximation in value space. Um, you've heard me mention online methods or online computations and offline computations. So what do we mean by offline? Well, offline is 
an offline computation is uh, something that we do before U0 is applied, before the very first control is applied, before the system has started operating. That's what we mean by offline. By online, we mean either at U0 or after U0, okay? So basically we have a lot of time to do computations offline, but relatively limited time to do computations online. So within this general figure here, what are primarily online methods? First of all, there, is no, there are no strictly offline or strictly online methods because every method involves both some offline computation and some online computation. But primarily offline, the most of the computation is done offline, is, uh, is the type of method where the J tildes are computed before the control process begins. So we have these functions before U0 is applied. And examples of offline methods are neural network methods that give you, you plug in XK plus one and gives you instantly J tilde K plus one at XK plus one. Um, and uh, neural network and related methods. These are typical examples of offline methods. Now you need to train a neural network offline because it takes a lot of time to train it. You need a lot of time to generate data and a lot of time to train it. So it's very difficult to train to use a neural network online, except to generate values when you need them. Now methods that are primarily online are the ones for which the J tilde values are computed, not at every state but rather at the relevant next states, which are encountered during the process of control. So there are only n values to compute for an n horizon problem. And um, the primary examples of these are rollout and model predictive control, which is closely related to rollout. So that's one classification to keep in mind. Now, going back to this figure, there is this approximation, the possible approximation of the expected value. So a few, let me say a few things about the possibilities here. We can, one possibility is to modify the probability distributions of the problem. I'm sorry, that should be a UK here as a typo. The probability distributions, the given probability distributions to simplify the look ahead minimization and the calculation and, and various other calculations in, um, in the, of the system of the, of the method. And one major simplification of probability distributions, which is inspired by the linear quadratic control problems is to assume certainty equivalence, replace uncertain quantities with deterministic nominal values then the look ahead uh, problem and the tail, uh, it, the, the computation of, uh, of uh, J tilde is deterministic. So the, so the, the, the tail problems could be solvable by dynamic programming or by special deterministic methods online. So what's happening here is once you replace these random quantities with deterministic values, then the problem becomes deterministic. So deterministic methods come into play and make the computations simpler. There are other simplifications of similar type, for example, um, you may have uh, these probability distributions uh, obtained through forecasts. For example, this may represent the state of the weather. There may be a forecast here 
for uh, different states of the weather. And, um, uh, and, and once you get a new forecast, you can update, you can use certainty equivalence in the context of this, uh, uh, once you get the forecast. Here's another major pos possibility. I talked about POMDP last time, uh, which involves belief states. Um, okay, so the optimal policy here, what approximations thereof are functions of the belief states. However, we may be able to replace the belief states with state estimates as an approximation. And that makes our policies be functions of state estimates rather than belief states. That can simplify the computations a lot. There's a variation of certainty equivalence, which I'll call partial certainty equivalence, where you fix only some of the uncertain quantities to nominal values, and you treat the less as stochastic. So this again makes the calculation of expected values simpler. Finally, instead of replacing the probability distribution by a single deterministic value, you may be able to use a limited simulation uh, to approximate this expected value, uh, which amounts to reducing the number of possible values that WK can take with uh, probabilities that are determined by the simulation. There are all these probabilistic tricks that you can make to simplify uh, the, the, the probabilistic structure. Uh, there are others too. For example, the problem may involve correlated disturbances. You may ignore the correlations to simplify the probabilistic structure. Okay. Now, in this field, you hear the term model free and model based model-free methods. Um, what does that mean? Uh, is it good or is it bad? Nowadays, if you read the literature, uh, people seem to be excited and very happy to use a model-free method because then uh, model-free does not require that you have a mathematical model involving formulas, uh, it's all, uh, the computer figures, figures, it, figures it all out. So it's good not to have to, not to need a model, uh, a mathematical model for your problem. Now, when I got into this field, model three was really very bad for the, at, at that time, because that meant that you had no methods that would be effective or reliable to solve the problem. So is it good or is it bad? It's not very clear to me. One thing that's certainly true is that there's no free lunch here. If something is given to you free, there's something else that's going to be expensive, okay? And it's just a question of, uh, of, uh, of trade-off between various two, 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 two different uh, uh, characteristics of the problem. Now, in the artificial intelligence view of uh, reinforcement learning, a lot is made about the capability to interact with the environment. Like, uh, okay, a robot goes into a new environment and figures out what the environment is about and what are good things to do within this environment. This is viewed as a higher form of intelligence. And indeed, if you can achieve it, then it is a higher form of intelligence. The problem is that for the moment, it's a goal that's not, uh, not, has not quite been attained. It's a very difficult problem to deal with combined model identification and control, which is what this idea of interacting with the environment and, uh, and, uh, and controlling the environment based on the results of the interaction is. So for our course, it's going to be all model-based we're not going to deal with combined identification and control. We're not going to deal with identification at all. 
we assume that the model is given to us, it may be given in terms of mathematical formulas, or it may be given in terms of a simulator, a computer simulator, a computer model, in other words. <clears throat> we also allow the possibility that the model may change on us, but it's always given to us. We don't build it, okay? All the methods that we are going to discuss assume that the model is available or when it changes, it is given to you by somebody else. So that's an easy way to get done with the difficulties, um, but that's what we're going to do. Now I mentioned here simulation and indeed simulation is a very important part of reinforcement learning. And uh, it is useful if you don't have a mathematical model of the probabilities of uh, the disturbance probabilities or the system function, uh, but you do have a computer simulator that can emulate transitions according to these probabilities. It can emulate the cost function and the system function. So there are many situations where you have stochastic phenomena that are very hard to model in terms of formulas, but they are very easy to simulate, like queuing systems, the primary example. Customers come in to a queuing system and they are served according to a complicated service discipline. And it may be very easy to build a simulator, a computer simulator of that queuing system. However, to describe the probabilities by which the various customers move within the queuing system may be extremely difficult. So that's a situation where a sim simulator may be useful. Now there's another situation, which is interesting, where you have all the probabilities you need by means of explicit formulas. However, you prefer not to use them, but use instead a simulator. There is, a, the, the reason is that computing expected values uh, with given probability distributions may be very hard and it may be easier to use sampling in Monte Carlo simulation. For example, a trivial example, if you have a huge sum of numbers to compute, uh, it may be very difficult to do. If the numbers, okay, astronomical number, uh, uh, a sum of an astronomical number of quantities. And it may be easier to use a Monte Carlo simulation and replace the sum with a Monte Carlo estimate. Similarly, people use Monte Carlo simulation to approximate integrals, which are, okay, infinite sums of numbers. So there are situations in reinforcement learning where both types of uh, need for simulator is uh, arises. And let me talk about a common example. How do you calculate approximate Q factors by simulation? In other words, we want to calculate this expected value using a simulator given J tilde K plus one and uh, how are we going to do it? So we have this cost to go approximation J tilde K. If you plug in a state, it will give us a number, perhaps by simulation itself, but it's available. And now suppose that we have a simulator that if I give it a sample state and a sample control, it will crank out the next state according to the probability distributions of the problem and a sample control. And then we can plug this into this state here into the J tilde functions given and get a sample Q factor. Now this Q factor is a sample of the of the random variable that we're going to we try to, to, to find this expected value, 
that corresponds to XK and UK, okay, a sample pair. So now we collect a large number of representative samples of state control, successor state, and transition cost. In other words, we collect a large number of these quadruplets here, and we calculate the corresponding sample Q factors. And now we fit this data, state control pairs to Q factors into a parametric family, and we do a least squares fit. So this is a sample Q factor, and we fit an approximation architecture that involves a parameter RK, like a neural network, for example, and we then obtain a parameter R bar, the best least squares fit, the least squares fit of the approximation architecture to the data. And then once we have this Q tilde, we can also obtain by one step look ahead this policy. <coughs> so that's how a simulator is used to approximate Q factors. It may involve, it involves a simulator for the first stage and also possibly a simulator for the remainder, generates training data and then fits an architecture to the data. Okay, so let's say a few things about multi-step uh, look ahead. Here's a diagram for least squares uh, for, for multi-step look ahead. It involves uh, an L stage finite horizon problem with cost approximation. Of course, uh, solving finite horizon problems, even with a reduced number of stages, can itself be quite difficult. So why do we want to go to multi-step look ahead? And the reason, the hope rather, is that look ahead over many steps will work better than look ahead over a few steps. Now, why is that? <clears throat> Any suggestions? In chess, it's well known that the longer look ahead you use, the better off you are. In fact, long look ahead is very important for so, other games also. People you have more use... I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I was just going to say you have more information available to make your decisions if you look more information. Yeah. More information that's exact, okay? Rather yeah. than dealing with this stuff by approximation, you use the real costs. Um, yeah, so that's the intuition. With long look ahead, we act optimally over more stages, and then we take an approximation. The, approx the approximate part is a smaller portion of the overall thing. We use a lot of exact data for the fir in, in, in these uh, stages of the long look ahead. In particular, with long enough look ahead to reach the end of the horizon, we are optimal, right? So if we do a better job of approximation with these extra steps, uh, we may afford to have a less accurate cost to go approximation J tilde. So this may simplify uh, the calculation of J tilde, or it may lessen the effect of approximation. Indeed, this hope is realized for the most part in uh, practice. However, the main difficulty here is that the minimization over many stages is costly. For example, in chess, the main impediment to get good chess players over the years uh, was precisely that doing look ahead over many multi-step look ahead over long look ahead horizons was very difficult with the computers of the time. The moment that computers became very powerful, immediately the performance of uh, chess playing programs jumped uh, a lot and uh, they were able to <clears throat> they were able to overtake uh, human players even before reinforcement learning came along 
So that's the problem with uh, with with uh, long look ahead. It can be very costly, and notice also that the difficulty becomes even more uh, acute when you have a stochastic problem. The reason is that for a stochastic problem, you have to look ahead at the at the possible controls that you can use. And then for each one of those values, find also the next states that you can that you find yourself in, depending on the WK, the stochastic parameters. So the branching factor increases twice as fast in stochastic problems than in deterministic problems. And you're faced pretty quickly with a huge look ahead tree that's very hard to deal with in stochastic problems. However, for deterministic problems, the situation is much better. So let's look at deterministic problems. <coughs> Assume that the problem is deterministic and finite state. Then uh, we have a look ahead tree of L steps. The branching factor is equal to the number of controls at each one of these states. And at the end, you have a cost function approximation. That's what multi-step look ahead is. On the other hand, if you look at the approximation in value space minimization problem, it involves, it's deterministic, and it involves a shortest path problem. A shortest path from the root of the tree, the current state where you are, to the terminal leaves of the tree, okay? Uh, and, uh, and then at each one of these leaves, of course, uh, you have to calculate the cost function approximation value. So solving such shortest path problems uh, is a lot easier than solving stochastic uh, look ahead problems. As a result, within time limitations of a given problem that you have, time limitations for deadlines for computing controls, you may be able to use a much larger look ahead tree for deterministic problems than for stochastic problems. Okay, well, this is true for finite number of states. Uh, on the other hand, uh, finite number of states and finite state, finite number of controls. On the other hand, if you have a continuous control space and continuous state space, then this look ahead tree involves infinite uh, choices, infinite number of choices at every, at every state. So a shortest path calculation is not possible. On the other hand, what you have instead is a deterministic continuous space problem, uh, which people in nonlinear programming know how to deal with. That's how MPC, model predictive control works. In MPC, typically, the states and the controls are continuous, but nonlinear programming algorithms are used to solve the look ahead problem including quadratic programming, for example, or other nonlinear programming algorithms. So that's the case where you have a deterministic problem, but continuous spaces. Now, if you have stochastic problems, a stochastic problem in continuous spaces, then Instead of nonlinear programming, there's another methodology called stochastic programming that can be used. And we're going to talk about that in, within one or two lectures. And uh, it is more time consuming to use nonlinear uh, stochastic programming than nonlinear programming because of the stochastic uncertainty. But it is a possibility um, to to deal with uh, the continuous state and control spaces. Otherwise, in this situation, the only alternative you may have would be to discretize the control space, which can be, has difficulties of its own. 
Okay, here's another possibility. Suppose the problem is stochastic and finite state. Then you have uh, uh, you have uh, this look ahead tree that has uh, a finite number of nodes, but the number of those nodes grows very fast because of the stochastic parameters here. However, you may consider using the first parameter, treat the first parameter as stochastic and treat the remaining uncertain parameters as uh, deterministic quantities. In other words, use cer certainty equivalence after the first step. So split the look ahead minimization into a first stochastic step and the deterministic remainder. This cuts down a lot of calculations and allows you to use a deterministic shortest path problem for the remaining steps after the first. That's a viable approach and it has its place within the arsenal of uh, uh, methods that you can, um, that you can use for multi-step look ahead. Are there any questions? Okay, we'll take a break for 15 minutes. But now I want, let's make this a working break. Um, and uh, pose to you the following challenge question. Um, okay, we go into long look ahead in order to produce a better policy. But is that hope always realized? In other words, will longer look ahead produce a better policy than shorter look ahead? The answer to this is, uh, is uh, usually, but we're not quite sure if it will do it in the, if it will happen always. So I want you to consider the following example and figure out what's going on. This is a deterministic four stage problem. We start from X zero, the initial state, and go to X four, the state after four steps. And the four steps are here, you see them here. Now, this problem is oversimplified, okay? And we have a choice only at the very first step, at the initial condition. We can choose the top branch or the bottom branch use a control U or a control U prime. In the subsequent stages, there is no choice. There's only one control to choose from. And the state space is this for the first uh, step, uh, the, the X1, um, uh, uh, the X1 uh, state space, X2 state space, X3 state space, and X4 is the terminal state. And uh, the numbers that you see here on these branches are the costs of the transitions. So if you choose this control and then go along this branch here, there's a total cost of one, three, four, okay? If you use the bottom branch, there's a cost of two, 12. So the top branch is better and it's the optimal the optimal policy, there are only two policies here, the one that chooses the top branch and the one that uses the bottom branch, the optimal policy is to use the top branch. So now let's consider instead of uh, an optimal calculation, let's consider multi-step look ahead with cost function approximation J tilde equal to zero, okay? We are free to use whatever J tilde we want, right? So we're going to choose it to be zero. As I said, there's a choice only at X zero. And I want you to consider two step look ahead and three step look ahead with this cost function approximation and see what happens. So let's come back in 15 minutes or so. And if you're not very hungry, and uh, 
uh, you can, uh, and you don't need to eat. You may, um, you may consider this problem and we can discuss it when we get back. Okay, so um, let's get back to this uh, challenge question. Are there, any, are there any comments about it? Uh, what's going on here? You have some question uh, or some uh, suggestion as to what's going on? Uh, I have a suggestion. Yeah. yeah. It appears that the two-step look ahead is what's going to produce the optimal control in this case, as opposed to the three-step look ahead. Um, so it, it, if you look ahead two steps, you see that by taking the control U, you would incur a cost of one since the JK tilde is zero. So that, and if you look ahead okay. under U prime, you would see that the cost is two. So right. you would choose optimal, uh, you would choose U as your minimum control. Right. However, if you looked at three steps ahead, uh, you would see by taking control U, the cost incurred would be three. Whereas taking the control U prime, the cost incurred would just be two. So you would choose control U prime, but we know that that's the suboptimal control. Right, exactly right. So the answer to the question is, will longer look ahead produce a better policy than shorter look ahead? Well, the answer is that usually longer is better, but not in this example for the reason that you mentioned. So how do you explain that? What's uh, going on here um, in, in some other way? Uh, can you see what's, uh, how about the role of this 10 here? If this 10 was not there, it was a one, okay, equally good as this one then the bottom path would be better. What's happening is that there is a bad, bad choice uh, waiting for us just over the edge of the look ahead. In other words, we're having edge effects. Uh, J tilde is an approximation and we take it to be zero. By taking it to be zero, the terminal cost approximation, we ignore what's happening beyond the limit of the look ahead. So we ignore the fact that around the corner, there is this high cost uh, transition that's waiting for us. So yes, we're looking at more stages and that's good, but it may be that by looking one more extra stage, we fall victim to an illusion of having a low cost transition here relative to the high cost transition here but still ignoring the, the bad transitions that lie ahead beyond the edge of the look ahead. So this is to say that there is no theorem to prove here. There are some error bounds, which are going, we're going to look at later, which suggest that uh, the, er well, they say that the error bound for longer look ahead is better, but it's a different thing to say that the error bound is better and a different thing to say that the performance is better for a um, uh, longer look ahead. So my suggestion is use as long look ahead as you can get away with, but do not be assured, not feel secure in the, uh, in the belief that uh, that you're going to be getting better performance. There are some exceptions. On the other hand, the rule, the typical uh, situation is that usually the rule is that longer is better. And you should try to get as long look ahead as possible from your uh, scheme as uh, you can get away with in terms of uh, computation time per stage. Are there any questions about this example? I have a quick question for this. Okay. So would you be able to not entirely mitigate the risk, but somewhat mitigate the risk if you had a better cost estimation 
So instead of assuming the J star is zero, if you had a better estimation, even though it might not be the perfect, um, it might not be 10, but it might be if it was two or three, you would get a better performing function. Well, a three will not help you in this situation. A two will just marginally, <laughs> okay. Um, the, the answer is uh, yes, if you have a better J tilde, in particular, if J tilde was equal to J star, okay, then certainly um, you would have, uh, uh, well, actually, you would be optimal then with two step look ahead or with three step look ahead. Um, the, the problem here is that uh, the J tilde is very bad on this example. And uh, um, so if you have a good approximation J tilde, you can be more secure in the belief that you're doing better with longer look ahead, but that's not a guarantee. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Any other question? We're going to move now into rollout for deterministic problems. Finite state problems with finite number of controls also. Discrete problems, in other words. Um, of course, I mentioned that one step look that uh, that one step or multi-step look ahead for stochastic problems is more diffi difficult. Uh, rollout for deterministic problems is has some particularly nice properties, so it's worth to consider separately. Okay, so what's the aim of rollout? Start with a policy, get a better policy. And it is the basic building block in policy duration. Rollout is really the first step in policy duration. And uh, uh, okay, here are some of the reasons why we pay so much attention to it. Rollout is by far the reinforcement learning method that uh, is the most reliable. And it's also relatively easy to understand. And also it's very easy to apply. If you have a base policy, it's a very simple programming exercise to write a rollout uh, program for it. It's not the most ambitious method, but it has been successful and reliably so. Why is it no, not the most ambitious method? Well, you do only one policy improvement. With policy duration, theoretically, it's possible to do multiple policy improvements and do better. On the other hand, uh, it's difficult to get policy duration to work for a number of reasons that we are going to examine in this course later. Rollout is also very general. It applies to deterministic problems, stochastic problems, finite horizon and infinite horizon. There's an important special case which sort of guides the art here because there's a lot of experience with model predictive control. And, uh, and so we, we can learn a lot in applying the rollout from our experience in model predictive control. And it's the other, the reverse is also true. Uh, in, we can apply model predictive control with a better perspective if we understand that is connected to reinforcement learning and to rollout in particular. Rollout also is a building block for many of the methods that we are going to, that have been used in practice, including approximate policy duration, Q learning, temporal differences, and so on. Uh, rollout is really one, uh, one step or multi-step uh, approximation in value space using a policy to generate cost approximations. And that sort of thing arises in many contexts within the reinforcement learning methodology. So there's good reason for us to study it. And uh, we're going to look now at deterministic problems. Okay. So now for deterministic problems, 
we're not going to use the, the name base policy. We're going to use the name base heuristic because we're going to use uh, uh, approximations that are that 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 make use of uh, more general heuristics than suboptimal policies. But anyway, uh, here is how the method works. Remember, it's deterministic. So after we reach a certain state, xk, there's a finite number of controls that we can use that, that we can choose from. Uh, they will lead you uh, deterministically to a next state. And then we have a heuristic. And from each one of these next states, we run them to the end of the horizon. What's a heuristic? Any algorithm for generating a completion of this trajectory, for generating controls and states. It doesn't have to be a policy. It can be any heuristic you can think of. So that's what the basic heuristic does. And at xk, we calculate all these q factors, the q factors that correspond to state control pairs, all the possible state control pairs. And these q factors consist of the sum of the first stage cost plus the cost of the heuristic. The heuristic generates a trajectory from any intermediate state and has a cost associated with it. And the cost of the heuristic starting from any state xk plus one is denoted by h of xk plus one, xk plus one. This is something that you can measure, right? You can run the heuristic in a simulator. It will generate a deterministic trajectory and we can calculate the cost of that trajectory, which is this number here. So we are at xk, we consider all possible controls, we calculate all the corresponding q factors by running the heuristic from each one of these next states, and then we select the control that has the minimum q factor. That's the rollout algorithm. After we do this selection, we move to a next state, one of these three here in this figure, and we continue. We generate all the possible controls. We run the heuristic from the endpoint of each one of these controls, choose the one that gives the best Q factor, go to the next state and continue up until the end. <coughs> this is a one step look ahead here. There's also a multi-step look ahead version and uh, Basically, in practice, the length of the look ahead is limited by the branching factor of the look ahead tree. The longer look ahead you have, the, the, the bigger look ahead tree you're going to have, the more number, the more, the more times you would have to run the base heuristic. So the longer the look ahead, the more the calculations are for each stage and uh, and uh, that's the limiting factor. Otherwise, it's a good idea to use multi-step look ahead in practice. So that's the algorithm. There's no simulation involved here, only a heuristic, any heuristic that you can run and uh, using a computer and uh, calculate the corresponding costs and the corresponding Q factors. So let's look at an example, the traveling salesman example. We've uh, looked at the traveling salesman problem in previous uh, lectures, and uh, it involves uh, N cities labeled zero to N minus one. Going from any one city to another city has a certain cost that we know, G of C, C prime, and what we want to do is find a minimum cost tour that visits each city once and only once and returns to the initial city. So we viewed this problem as a deterministic dynamic programming problem of the shortest path type where the states are the partial tours. They are 
sequences of distinct cities, but not complete. A complete tour is obtained at the end. You start from the initial city and go back to the, the a partial tour is only a sequence of the cities that you visited. And then you have to add the other cities, the remaining cities in an optimal way to complete, uh, to, well, in some way to complete the, the partial tour. So we have seen the optimal solution, the, net, the nature of the optimal solution of this problem. It involves an exponential number of states, uh, exponential in the number of cities. So it is impossible to solve the problem exactly for a substantial number of cities. However, rollout is a good choice. Uh, in practice, uh, people use a lot of different heuristics to solve this, this, uh, uh, this travel and sales or problem. In particular, a popular heuristic, not the best, but uh, one of those that's mentioned very often is the nearest neighbor heuristic. It is a greedy heuristic. Uh, given the current partial tour, then it chooses the best next city, the best one hop extension of the partial tour. So it looks at all the cities that the salesman has not visited yet and finds the one that has a smallest traversal cost. So it's myopic. It looks only one city ahead. That's the nearest neighbor heuristic. So the rollout algorithm starts at some city and then at some, and given a partial tour, let's say, which considering, consisting of the cities, then it looks at all the remaining cities and chooses the one that has minimum one step chooses the one that has minimum uh, uh, traversal cost. Then after it goes to the next city, looks again at the remaining cities and looks at one hop ahead and goes to the next city and so on and completes the tour in this way. Now the rollout algorithm does the following. Um, given the partial tour represented by this state, it looks at all the possible next cities and then runs the nearest neighbor heuristic from each one of those and looks at the entire tour for each one of the possibilities and chooses the branch that leads to the complete tour of minimum cost. Start the same city, given the partial tour of distinct cities, selects the next city as the one that yields the minimum cost tour under the nearest neighbor heuristic. Okay, so it's very easy to apply. This is typical of deterministic rollout. You have a heuristic and to roll it out is a few lines of code, okay? All you need to do is generate the next states and run the heuristic subroutine from each one of those and then compare the results and pick the result that's best. So let's see now how that will work in a specific case. Okay. Here we have four cities, A, B, C, D. And uh, the intercity travel course is what you see here in this matrix. So to go from A to B, it's five units. To go from A to D is 15 units. These are the costs going from B to A, C, and D, and so on. So we formulate this as a dynamic programming problem as before, OK? Uh, you recall in the example that we looked at in previous lectures, we formed the, we formulate the problem with the initial state being an arbitrarily chosen city, in this particular case, city A. And then we look at the partial tours of two cities, B, C, and D, 
These are the two city tours that emanate from A. Then we consider the three city tours from each one of those using going to city C or D from A, B, and so on. And then, uh, well, once we reach this point here, because we have only four cities, there's only one choice after each one of those. And then there's only one choice after each one of those to go back to city A. And the black numbers that you see here are the numbers given by this matrix here of intercity travel. Okay. So the red numbers are the optimal numbers, the dynamic programming numbers. Optimal costs to go. 15, once, and so on. Okay. 15 plus 3 is 18, 1 plus 3 is 4, and so on. And we have a choice over here, and we have a choice over here. Is the figure clear? The formulation of the problem is a dynamic programming problem, and uh, the execution of the algorithm. It's clear, Professor. Yes, go ahead. I just said it's clear. Okay, good. Okay, so now what's the optimal policy? After we have done our offline training to calculate the red numbers, we use online play and we generate the optimal tour. How do we do that? Well, at the initial state, we look at the three possible choices and we choose the one that has minimum one stage cost plus cost to go. So this is 13 here. This is 28 and this is this is this is 40, okay? 15 plus 25 is 40. So we go over here. And uh, then we do the same kind of calculation. We go over here, over here and so on. So the red path is the optimal path. Now Let's apply the base heuristic, the nearest neighbor heuristic. Uh, I claim that it will produce this blue path. Why is that? Okay, so here we look at the nearest neighbor. The nearest neighbor to A is C, okay? It has cost of one. So the base heuristic moves over here. Then it looks at the two possible neighbors, B and D and chooses this one, which has a cost of three. Then it has no other choice but to go to B and then to A. So that's what the base heuristic does, the nearest neighbor heuristic. And uh, it's quite bad because uh, it's myopic, okay? Uh, it doesn't, uh, has, has no idea, has no clue that further down the line, there's this bad choice that's unavoidable. So it generates a cost of uh, 428, okay? As opposed to 13, which is the optimal. Now, how will the rollout work? Can someone trace the steps here? Rollout using the nearest neighbor heuristic as base heuristic. So if, if you started at A, you would okay. look at the states A, B, A, C, and A, D. And from each of these, use the greedy kind of shortest path calculation to get back to A again. And yeah. then uh, this will each, uh, yeah, you'll get a value for each of these. And then starting from A, you would choose the minimum value over A, B, A, C, and A, D based on that heuristic. Okay, good. So give me the calculation. Oh, uh, Let's okay. take this, uh, we have to compare three Q factors. One is the Q factors corresponding to this, the Q factor corresponding to this, and the Q factor corresponding to this. So what would these numbers be, these Q factors be? Wouldn't it be, I mean, there's no choices really after, after the, this level of the tree, right? So like, well, that's not, okay. 
So, so going from AB to ABD, you would, you would, you would, you would have to, you would choose that edge in under that heuristic, and then the rest is all chosen for you going back to A. Right. So, in fact, that that number on AB is still eight, and also for AC, um, it's still unchanged there. And then for AD. Um, okay, from AB, I have to compare this path here. Yeah. And this path here, right? Yeah. Uh huh. And so, this one is better under, it can be yeah. uh, under, okay. Actually, what we're doing here is we're running the base heuristic, the nearest neighbor heuristic. So yeah. we do a calculation between this branch and this branch. Right. This one gives you a four, it takes you here. And mm -hmm. then you're right, you, you have no choice. So the nearest neighbor heuristic going from here takes this path and right. gives me a Q factor that is eight plus five, which is 13. Mm -hmm. Now this is only one Q factor. I have to compute two other Q factors corresponding to these two other branches. So what will that give you? So for AC, you'll still have 27 by the same heuristic because you'll have to choose the three over the 20. The three over the 20 is the nearest neighbor. Yep. And then you have no choice here. And so you have 28. So uh, we got 13 this way. We got 28 this 28 right. this way. And then how about the this branch one? here? So from AD, you would choose ADC, uh, and then you have no choice. Um, ADC, right. And then you have no choice. So that's 18 plus 20 plus 5. So that's uh, 43, right? Yeah, so in this so that's case, bad too. That's bad, and this one is the best. Yeah, so in this case, okay, the rule good. out is the optimal policy as well. Okay, but wait a minute. Now, this gave us only the very first step of rollout of the rollout algorithm. It moved us from here. It moved us here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now we have to redo the calculation, right? Yes. So how would that will that go? Uh, so you would have to look at states. A, B, C, and A, B, D, and then recalculate the based on the nearest neighbor heuristic. And yeah, yeah. so A, B, D, you would get four plus the costs would be eight. And then A, B, C, uh, you would get 18 plus the cost, which is 20. So uh, you're comparing 38 with eight. Right. So, you, so, so, you, yeah. so the rollout will choose from here, it will choose this one. And after that, it has no choice. Mm -hmm. So the rollout is going to find the optimal policy as opposed to the base heuristic, which gives you a suboptimal policy. Yeah. It's an example of um, cost improvement, right? Uh, you can prove that uh, for heuristics of this type, you always get cost improvement in rollout. But intuitively, what makes the rollout work better here? Is it because you're comparing more states with exact knowledge? And well, you're estimating after the first step, but you have the three first with exact knowledge. And so then you're getting more information to make a decision off of. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Any other suggestions? Yes, you're right. You are using more knowledge, more information. Uh, you compare the very first step is, uh, you make a comparison that is exact. You look at all three choices. Uh, and also, uh, but there's something else also here. The base heuristic is, is myopic. It looks only one step ahead, okay? So at every step, it compares just the arcs that are outgoing. It doesn't go down the line to see what lies ahead. By contrast, at the very first city over here, the rollout looked all the way down to the end. In other words, it has long-term vision and goes down all the way to the end, compare this path, and now this path, and now this path. So 
it doesn't get caught by surprise down the line because it looks when I, okay, as it's not always true, but it looks at more paths and also it looks further down the line from the initial state. It has what I call long range vision, which the base heuristic lacks completely. And that's a key thing to understand about rollout. It looks all the way to the end of the horizon and looks at paths that, that, that are multi-step as opposed to being one step, uh, at least for the case of a base heuristic. Of course, uh, you don't need really. Professor, so, I have a question, but you can continue. I can uh, ask my question after you finish talking. Go ahead with your question. I'll come back to what I was saying. Um, OK, uh, so in this example, when you were simulating it uh, in the second step after AB, uh, you did another rollout, or we have to do another rollout. Is that correct? AD? Uh, AB. AB, yes. Uh, but in this example, we actually don't need to do any other rollouts after the first rollout, right? Because you can just follow the base heuristic after that, because the first rollout already did all the work for you. Uh, it happened uh, like that, but uh, but it is it's not, not clear place. because the heuristic is fixed, right? From any given state, it's not going to change the value that it's computing. Yeah. Okay. So my question suppose is, that this fifteen. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Suppose that this fifteen here was minus fifteen. What would happen then? Okay. Um, well, in, in that case as well, after the first rollout, oh, okay, okay, I see what you mean. Thank you. If that was not 15, but minus 15, then at the first uh, rollout step, you would go along this path. But then once you go here, you would look at this path. Right, that makes sense. Thank you. So no, that will find the optimal policy. Right, right. So Thank it you. is self-correcting as it goes down the line, if it makes a mistake, in the beginning of its path, I'm talking about rollout. Mm -hmm. If it makes a mistake, then it has a chance to correct later. Right. So it will Th consider quite a few a paths here and uh, will not consider all the paths. That's why it's not guaranteed to find the optimal. However, mm -hmm. it will do much better than myopic uh, kind of heuristics. Mm -hmm. All right, I just got confused by this example, I guess that's just, but the minus 15 helps, yeah. Cool. Okay. Okay. And if you have minus 15 here, then the optimum is going to be this one, if I'm not mistaken, or if it's 100, minus 150, certainly this would be. And uh, the rollout will find again the optimal solution. Because once it gets to this step, it will realize its mistake. It will realize that that's not the right thing to do and then switch and go along this path here. Okay. So okay, thanks one follow-up question. question. Yeah, one follow-up question to what he, he asked. So if I took the this node here, the 15, and I made that a minus 15, would that be an example of where I get a suboptimal uh, rollout heuristic? Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, if you make this minus 150, I don't know if 15 will do it. Yeah, it will probably do it. Yeah, then the optimum is going to be this, but the, the roller is still going to choose this one because it make an irretrievable mistake at the very first step, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, now I forgot what I was going to say, but it doesn't matter, <laughs> it's okay. Any other questions? It's probably, we probably covered with these questions. Thank you for the questions. Okay. So, okay, now let's get into the theoretical aspect of rollout. We mentioned that there's a cost improvement property but it's not automatic. For deterministic problems where any heuristic goes, not necessarily a policy, 
in the dynamic programming sense, cost improvement is not automatic. Some special conditions need to hold in order for the rollout policy to have no worse performance than the base heuristic. And there are two conditions of this type. One is called sequential consistency. The base heuristic is if it is sequentially consistent. The other is sequential improvement. The base, base heuristic is sequentially improving. And um, a sequentially consistent heuristic is also sequentially improving. Uh, however, uh, not the reverse is not true. And moreover, any heuristic, no matter how stupid, can be modified to become sequentially improving. But we're going to do this in the next lecture. Now, what's the definition of sequentially consistent? The base heuristic is sequentially consistent if it uh, sort of uh, is faithful to its own earlier decisions in the following sense. If starting, we say that the base heuristic is sequentially consistent if when it starts from xk and generates this sequence here of successive states, then when it goes to xk plus one, generates the same sequence, the same tail of the sequence. Okay, let me repeat. It's called sequentially consistent if for any state, if it generates this sequence, then when it goes to the next state, x k plus one, it generates the same remainder, the same sequence as the remainder of the first sequence. So it stays the course. Once it makes a decision at x k to go through x k plus one, then it's going to go from xk plus one to xk plus two and so on. Would we'll stick to the same sequence up until it finds a better sequence. Now, clearly, if the, if the base heuristic is uh, implemented with a legitimate dynamic programming policy, then this property is true, okay? because the decision at xk plus one was based on the policy, mu k plus one, and the same is going to be true when after it goes to xk plus one. So if you have the base heuristic be a legitimate dynamic programming policy, it has the sequential consistency property. On the other hand, uh, it is possible to have a heuristic that's not implemented by a legitimate dynamic programming policy. And when it moves to the next state, it sort of changes its mind and goes a different way. We allow this possibility, but then it will not be sequentially consistent. Now, the typical type of sequentially consistent heuristics are greedy heuristics, like the nearest neighbor heuristic for the travel and sales on problem. You can see this by examining the definition. If you look at your notes, you'll see other examples. It's pretty easy to see that greedy heuristics uh, implement some policy. The policy is assigned to each state the best one-step choice of control. So that's the definition of sequential consistency. And there's an, another criteria a sequentially improving heuristic, uh, uh, the base heuristic is sequentially improving if it has the following property. At a given state xk, the best heuristic q factor at xk is less or equal to the heuristic cost at xk. In other words, this equation holds. This is the heuristic cost starting from xk. This is a Q factor corresponding to the base heuristic when the first choice of control is UK. And the minimum heuristic Q factor has to be less than the heuristic cost. That's the criterion for sequential improvement. Now, 
if the heuristic is sequentially consistent, then by dynamic programming arguments, this cost from xk is the heuristics q factor at xk. So it's larger or equal to the minimum q factor at xk. So this inequality holds under sequential consistency, but the reverse is not true. And there are interesting cases where the heuristic is not sequentially consistent, but it is sequentially improving. And the most prominent case is MPC, model predictive control. It turns out that for model predictive control, you don't have sequential consistency, but you do have sequential improvement. And that's the key for rollout to work, for the model predictive control algorithm to work, to give you a stable policy and cost improvement. Now, here's a theorem. It says that assume that the base heuristic is sequentially improving and let P tilde, pi tilde, be the rollout policy based on that heuristic and let, uh, and let this be its cost. Then the rollout policy has a better cost than the heuristic, starting from the initial, the, the same initial state. So in other words, this is, a, this is the cost improvement property. And the proof of this is very simple. It's by induction. Uh, notice that this inequality holds not only at time zero, but also at any intermediate state and any stage. Here's the proof by induction. It holds at the end because the, at the terminal state, the cost function is, uh, is GN. The heuristic cost is also GN trivially, and the same is true for the rollout. So we have this condition holding for K equals N. And suppose that this condition holds for index K plus one. And let us verify that this inequality holds for k equals k. So this is the calculation. The rollout cost starting at xk is equal to the cost of the first stage. This is the rollout control at xk. And this is the rollout cost for the remaining stages, starting from the next state generated by the rollout policy. Now, we have the induction hypothesis that says that JK plus one is less than XK plus one uniformly. So I use this induction hy hypothesis here. And this expression is less than this expression here. Now, according to the definition of the rollout policy, the rollout policy minimizes this expression here, is the UK that minimizes this expression. So this is equal to the minimum over UK and by sequential improvement, I have this last inequality holding. So, Assuming the induction hypothesis for k plus one, I showed that the result holds for k and the induction proof is complete. It's a very simple proof that can also be tweaked around for generalizations of this theorem. And uh, we are going to do such generalizations in the next lecture. Okay, are there any questions about the definitions and about the, the proof? It's a very, very simple proof, but it's important for our purposes. And I want you to go through it and understand it.
Okay. Let me ask you a question. If you don't ask questions, I'm going to ask you questions. For this example here, give me an example of a base heuristic that's not sequentially. I said that the that the nearest neighbor heuristic is sequentially consistent. Because uh, okay, I mean you can see it uh, by examination of the possibilities and also argue more generally. Give me an example of a heuristic a base heuristic that's not sequentially consistent. Like a choose a neighbor uniformly at random, something like that would not be consistent. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably a correct uh, 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 statement, but I don't want to introduce randomness here because everything is deterministic. So give me a deterministic choice. It's kind of silly and does not, uh, does not follow the nearest neighbor. It follows the nearest neighbor at some point, but then, uh, then it uh, it follows something else. Uh, Uh, can you do this like uh, Lucas one step ahead? Look another step ahead. So is is this is this like greedy or another step ahead? Two step ahead? Yeah. Okay, but give me a, give me a heuristic of your choice. So if you look two step ahead, then you will the first one you will get with one three. Yeah. Perhaps in this example is consistent because the next step will be three, four. So, yeah. so, so this is not the answer. Okay. How about a strange base heuristic that uh, chooses uh, the nearest neighbor at the first stage, but chooses the neighbor that's furthest away in the second stage? Any silly base heuristic will, is legitimate here, right? So nearest neighbor for the first choice and, uh, and uh, and furthest away Okay, the heuristic is the following. For the first choice, I choose all the way the nearest neighbor. But at the second stage, I choose all the way the, not the nearest neighbor, but the farthest neighbor. So here I'm going to choose this, make this choice according to this base heuristic, but once I get here, I switch my tune. And instead of looking at the nearest neighbor, I look at the neighbor furthest away. And now I like this one and I go this way. So now this is worse than the this is worse than the base heuristic starting from here, okay? You see that? <laughs> uh, maybe I'm not expressing it very well. I'm screwing up deliberately the base, heuris the base heuristic so that it follows uh, the nearest neighbor uh, from this stages, from, from the initial state, but the furthest away neighbor from these stages. Then it goes over here at the very first step and lands over here. But now it has uses a different kind of heuristic, a furthest away heuristic, which chooses this branch as opposed to that branch. Now, once it's stuck to go over here, then it has to follow this path, whereas 
Uh, the the base heuristic from the starting state is optimal. The base heuristic from the rollout policy is this one, which is worse than the base heuristic uh, from the starting state. Okay. Okay, here's an exercise for you. Try to work out this example so that the base heuristic is uh, chooses the path of the nearest neighbor from A, but chooses the path of the furthest away uh, uh, neighbor uh, from these um, states. It's not a very intelligent base heuristic, but it shows that it's possible that the rollout can do worse than the base heuristic if uh, you don't have the sequential uh, improvement condition. Maybe what I'll do is write up this exercise and, uh, and have it uh, as part of the homework. Uh, or maybe it's too obvious, I don't know. Any questions? Any comments? Okay, so we've reached the end of this lecture. And uh, next time we will do extensions of deterministic rollout. Um, then we will uh, look at uh, problems of um, extension of rollout, but for continuous time control. And there are our subject, our course, focuses on discrete time problems, but looking at continuous time problems and deterministic rollout is actually gives a clue of what can go wrong in discrete time problems as well. So we will look at this, uh, uh, at this issue here. Then we're going to go to stochastic problems and look at rollout and uh, the extension of the uh, cost improvement property uh, for them. Then uh, look at uh, probabilistic approximation in Monte Carlo research. And then look at continuous space deterministic rollout as a prelude to looking at the model predictive control. Continuous space, so we don't have a finite number of controls at every state, we have a continuum of controls. Uh, I don't know how you're doing with homework. Uh, we did get homework, but uh, according to our current deadline, there's a new homework that's due on Sunday. And uh, I'm planning to announce a new homework that's going to be due the Sunday in the next week. Does that seem reasonable or are you guys in trouble with homework? Were you only planning on having at most four homeworks throughout the whole semester? Is that what it said at the first class? I can't remember. Uh, right. I'm planning, I'm still planning to have um, uh, four. Yeah. Uh, but uh, these homeworks have been very simple. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I may go to five. And the reason I've gone to simple homeworks is uh, basically to force you to read the class notes. <laughs> because yeah. uh, I, unless a homework set is due, the class notes sometimes are set aside. So I may go to five homework, but these are toy homeworks, really. And the one that I'm planning to give also, I think the third one, the second one is a toy toy uh, homework. The third one is a little bit more substantive. The fourth one is, um, is a little bit more, has a little bit more meat uh, to it. Then, um, then I would just say that- But the question is, are you going to be able to do the homework for Sunday next week? I think it's okay. Okay, I hear no dissenting voice, so uh, we're going to leave it at that. And uh, you may consider looking at the video lecture from uh, number four from uh, the 2019 offering. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going fast for many of you, 
And also, I'm not giving enough examples. I can see that you guys light up when I give examples, but I can't spend too much time with examples because they take so much time and we have a lot of material to cover. So, so uh, it helps if uh, you have uh, prepared yourself by watching some video lecture ahead of time. Okay, so that's uh, all for today, and uh, we'll see you next week.